you know, the overarching motivation behind this work is, is basically the observation that marine terminating glaciers uh, undergo large fluctuations in volume over decadal timescales uh, or even longer timescales due to variations in frontal ablation, where by frontal ablation I'm referring to calving and submarine melting. And those processes are, of course, poorly constrained, otherwise we wouldn't be studying them or maybe not in quite as much earnest. And they're inherently interdisciplinary, so we're talking about a boundary that delineates the glacier from ocean and, and how that boundary moves with time. Um, lately, I've been thinking a lot about glacier response to climate um, in terms of some simple feedback loops, and I think this is an instructive way to think about why we study marine terminating glaciers and tidewater glaciers. Um, so if you first look at a, a glacier that is land terminating, we don't have to worry about interactions with the ocean. If the response of that glacier to climate change is basically determined by two feedback loops. Um, first, there's a positive feedback loop between surface mass balance and surface elevation. So if you were to, uh, for example, decrease the surface mass balance, that's going to cause the glacier's surface to drop. As the surface drops, it, it moves into a, lower, a warmer climate where it would melt faster. So you get a runaway feedback loop there. Um, but that runaway process is counteracted by a negative feedback loop between surface mass balance and glacier length. If you were, again, to lower the surface mass balance, that would cause the glacier to retreat. Um, and as the glacier retreats, you're removing the, the, the part of the ablation area, and particularly the part of the ablation area that receives or experiences the most melting. So that tends to increase the surface mass balance. So that's, that's a negative stabilizing feedback loop. Um, so then if you took two glaciers, uh, comparable glaciers, one land terminating, one marine terminating, similar climate, um, and subjected them to climate change, you would observe the marine terminating glacier undergoing much larger variations in volume. And that says that there's some other feedback loops um, built into the system. Um, and during retreat, it might look something like this, uh, where you have, uh, as the glacier retreats, it retreats into deeper water. Um, and that causes the ice flow to pick up. As the ice speed increases, the surface elevation drops. As the surface elevation drops, then it um, causes the surface mass balance to continue to drop. So basically, you have this built-in uh, feedback loop that offsets the stabilizing glacier length feedback loop. And I would argue that pretty much everything in here that's black is something that we can model fairly well as long as we know what the climate is doing and we know the, the subglacial topography. We can, we can do a pretty good job there. Um, but the part that, that we struggle with a lot is this part in red, which is the essentially the frontal ablation, so the submarine melting and iceberg calving. And we've observed uh, fast retreats occurring due to this, these dynamic feedbacks. Um, Columbia Glacier in Alaska is a, is a um, famous example. It's retreated something like 20 kilometers since the early 1980s. Um, but this isn't unique to Alaska either. We see similar things happening in Greenland. So um, Jakob Savanisbury is a, a famous example there where it had a, a stable terminus position until about the early 2000s, from 1950 to 2000 or so and in the last 15 years has retreated something like 20 kilometers. Um, so in this particular study, we're focusing on, on the, the plume dynamics. Um, so we're, we're looking at what's happening right at the glacier face, um, not worrying so much about what happens in the outer part of the fjord. Um, and so the, the, I guess the conceptual understanding that we have going into this is that there's subglacial discharge coming out from the glacier. Um, this is fresh water that's buoyant. It's going to mix with some of this warm, salty water and rise upward towards the surface of the fjord and then flow outward as a plume, um, either at the surface or at, at some intermediate depth. And as it's rising, it's, it's warm compared to the glacier, so it'll, it'll melt uh, the glacier ice and, and, and train that additional fresh water into the plume. Um, I'm just going to switch to a time-lapse video. This also helps to motivate this particular project. Um, what I'm going to show is four days, or it's actually uh, just a short clip, but it's each, each of these boxes represents a different day, so September 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. Um, it's one
photo every 10 seconds, and the videos are roughly synchronized in time. So you're looking at basically the same time of day for each of those four days. And what you'll see is, is that during these four days, there was a, um, a major rainstorm that hit while we were in the field, and the, the character of the fjord changed quite a bit. There's a very strong plume coming out on the 9th and 10th. Um, it, it's also much more turbid than what we saw uh, in the first couple of days. I'll just let that, oh, there we go. So it's a, a much more vigorous plume um, as the water from that rainstorm drained through the glacier and, and emerged at the terminus. And so basically in this project, what we want to do is understand how does that water that flows through the glacier affect, affect the, the character of this plume and some rain melting associated with the rising of that plume. Uh, during that same field study, this was in 2012, um, we did a series of oceanographic transects and used a heat and mass budget to try and estimate the subglacial discharge and submarine melt rates. Um, and there's uh, a fair bit of scatter in this data, um, but what we think we see is an increase in the submarine melt uh, flux as the subglacial discharge increases. There's also a data point here from a survey that was done in 2003. And this is also consistent with some modeling work by Adrian Jenkins. So I guess I would say an overarching project objective is, is really to derive a simple parameterization of submarine melting that is, number one, determined from field observations. So we're going to get in close to the glacier terminus and, and actually um, try to measure melt in a couple of different ways. And we also want a parameterization that's suitable for larger scale climate models. Um, and then a, a secondary objective is, is, is to improve our understanding of how the glacier responds to variations in submarine melting and again focused on what's happening near the glacier terminus. So if you undercut the glacier, does that change the flow regime and uh, help promote calving, that sort of thing. Um, so why Leconte Glacier? Uh, you know, we're funded by Arctic Natural Sciences. Leconte is not in the Arctic, um, but there's a lot of reasons that we, be, we believe it behaves similarly to glaciers in Greenland, for example. Um, so first of all, the fjord has a relatively simple geometry. It's, it has kind of a snake-like geometry, actually, but it doesn't have any, any side fjords coming in. There aren't any major rivers, anything like that. And, and so what we're, you know, the water, the fresh water in that fjord is primarily coming from the glacier. The fjord depths are comparable to fjords in Greenland, uh, a couple hundred to 300 meters, so not as, not as deep as the, the, the big three, I guess, but it's, it's similar to many of the other outlets in Greenland. Um, and in particular, it's, it's deep enough that the, the upwelling plume will be well developed by the time it reaches the surface. We observe a large range in subglacial discharge with values comparable to values reported from Greenland. Uh, we see a strong seasonality in water temperature. The water at Leconte is going to be a bit warmer than Greenland. So what we've seen between about April and I should say May and September, it, our temperature is ranging from maybe four to seven degrees Celsius. Uh, presumably in the winter, it'll be a bit colder. Um, and that's, that four degrees is kind of on the, the upper end of what we see in Greenland. Um, but you could also say this is the cont is perhaps what Greenland will look like going into the future. And, and then also we are going to be sampling across a range of temperatures. The, if you look at the melt rates, the melt rates at Leconte are higher, but the melt fluxes are similar. And so we, you, we're removing a similar amount of ice from submarine melting as you, as you observe at some of the larger, or sorry, not larger, some of the, some of the glaciers in Greenland. Um, it's just concentrated over a, a narrower or smaller cross-sectional area. It's also a fast flowing glacier, 25 meters per day or so, um, so quite similar to what's observed in Greenland. And then a, an important feature of this field site is that it's, it's accessible year round, um, so it doesn't have a dense pack of icebergs like we see in, in places in Greenland, so you can, you can actually get into the fjord with quite a bit of confidence. Um, it's also very close to the town of Petersburg, which, which makes for a good logistical hub. And so this means that we'll be able to to visit the fjord throughout the year. Um, we have six field campaigns planned um, spanning basically April through November um, of, 
but it's it's two 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 years, 2016 and 17. So we'll be going at various points, but um, we'll basically be able to sample the water during those periods. Um, and then in addition, there'll be some longer term monitoring equipment to help us get an idea of what's happening in the the winter months that we don't visit. The project team consists of myself. I am the lead PI at the University of Alaska Southeast. I am a glaciologist with a background in uh, tidewater glaciers, iceberg calving, glacier seismology. Um, so I'll be in charge of the project oversight and logistics, and I'll also lead uh, the parts of the project related to glacier dynamics and glacier flow. So we'll be using a variety of measurements, um, time-lapse photography, GPS, seismometers, and a terrestrial scanning radar. And I'll also be mentoring a postdoc that will be based here in Juneau. Um, and then we also have Roman Motika, who's employed by University of Alaska Fairbanks, also a glaciologist. Um, he's employed by UAF, but he lives here in Juneau, so he and I work quite closely together. He actually just lives down the street from me. Um, and Roman has a, also quite a bit of experience working on tidewater glaciers, and I would say he's pioneered some of the early work on submarine melting at least in the northern hemisphere. Um, he also has a lot of familiarity with the field site, which will be invaluable. He's, he's had several um, studies there throughout the years. And Roman is going to be helping or leading the meteorological data collection and melt modeling, um, assisting with some of the oceanographic observations and analysis as well, similar to the previous projects. Um, and then in addition, uh, we have David Sutherland from the University of Oregon. He's an oceanographer with a background in fjord circulation and coastal currents. He's going to be leading the collection and analysis of hydrographic data and also be doing some model comparisons. And we'll be mentoring one graduate student. And then just down the road from him is Jonathan Nash, Oregon State University, an oceanographer with background in turbulence, internal waves, and mixing. And he'll be making measurements of the, this upwelling plume with, um, I wrote here, autonomous vessels. But he's, doesn't, he told me he doesn't want to use the word vessel because that implies things that he's not ready to deal with. But it's basically a remote-controlled kayak that will have instruments on board and will get in close to the glacier in places that are not safe for us to go. And then he'll be co-advising. Um, I, I wrote here one graduate student that might actually be changing to a postdoc. I'm not sure yet where that's at. And Jonathan is also working closely with Eric Skillingstad at Oregon State, who's an oceanographer that does large eddy simulations and modeling of turbulence and internal waves. And so Eric's role will be to, to, to develop a plume model that will help to synthesize all of the observations that we're um, collecting and also to, to then take that model and explore a, a broader parameter space than what we might sample directly. This figure here from the proposal, from our proposal, I think really nicely shows what is probably the centerpiece of the project and, and really illustrates a lot of the different things that we're trying to do. Um, and so basically we have, uh, we're going to be using melt modeling and seismometers to try and quantify variations in subglacial discharge um, from the glacier. Um, we'll be uh, sorry, I should back up. We'll, we'll have, there's going to be six field campaigns. Three of them will involve intensive surveys. And during those three intensive surveys, we'll have a suite of instruments out. Um, and so in, in addition to doing the, this melt modeling that I just mentioned, we'll have um, a couple of boats in the fjord. One of the boats will be um, operating remote controlled kayaks pictured here, which will be getting in close to the, to the terminus and, and sampling the, the plume waters and, and the mixing that occurs there. Um, that boat will also be doing some multi-beam um, scanning of the face to, to look for cavities um, that might be melting out. And um, yeah, there was something else that I'm forgetting. Uh, I'm sure it'll come back to me in a second. And then there'll, there'll be another boat which will just serve a purpose of, of performing oceanographic transects going back and forth through um, multiple tidal cycles. And then while that's happening, there will be a team camped up on the margin of the, of the glacier operating high rate time lapse cameras. Um, there'll be a weather station there, and there'll also be a scanning radar, um, which we'll use to, uh, the, the radar and the cameras we'll use to track motion of the glacier and also the fjord surface currents. Um, and this is a, a figure we put together uh, just to illustrate what the sort of data that we think we'll be able to get out of this, these intensive field 
uh, surveys. Um, on the top is a time-lapse photo with some velocity vectors imposed on top of it. Those velocity vectors were derived from comparing subsequent time-lapse photos, and so that gives us an idea of the, the fjord surface currents. Um, these red lines on top of that photo are indicating tracks that one of the remote-controlled kayaks might be taking, and uh, that um, will be sampling the, the fjord waters. And, and so then on the side here are supposed to be um, velocities and shear energy dissipation rates that we'll, we'll be able to collect from within this box. And then those observations will be synthesized with the, the plume model that Eric Skillingstead is working on. This is just a, a, a quick little um, proof of concept model that he put together for the proposal. See that this is this top panel is the salinity. Um, so dark is fresher water, and and then you see the plume flowing out towards the surface, uh, flowing up down fjord at, at the surface. And from this, he was also calculating an instantaneous melt rate. So the idea is that that his model will be, um, you know, or, uh, you know, developed in coordination with the data that we've collected. Um, and then. In addition to those intensive field surveys, we'll have three field surveys that, in which we'll just be acquiring hydrographic transects. So we'll be able to use this heat and mass budget approach um, that's been used in the past. Um, we'll also have a continuous mooring in the fjord, and then we'll have some longer-term glaciological instrumentation, so weather stations, GPS receivers, time-lapse cameras, and seismometers. And the idea is that the, these things will give us a broader range of parameter space that we can explore with the model. Um, so that's basically the projects. Um, I thought I would also just talk a little bit about some of the, the innovative instrumentation that we'll be using. Um, some of the some of the methods we're using are, are you know, well tested and um, have, have been used in multiple different studies, but we also have some new or, or fairly new instrumentation, which I think allows us to to view this, this glacier fjord system in some, some new and interesting ways. Um, and so one of the things we'll be doing is using um, seismic tremor to quantify variations in subglacial discharge. This is a paper, this is a figure from a paper that just came out, um, which I'm a co-author, um, where we had a seismometer that's this red box here sitting next to Mendenhall Glacier, so this white here is Mendenhall Glacier. A Mendenhall Glacier terminates in a lake, which is gauged by the USGS. Um, so we have really nice stream gauge measurements. And what we found is that there's this seismic tremor between about 1 and 10 hertz um, that correlates really well with subglacial discharge. Um, and so the bottom right panel has the, the discharge from the USGS hydrograph in blue, and then the black is the, the seismic tremor. So basically, between 1 and 10 hertz, we integrate that um, Frequency content so that that um, yeah that that energy and and then plot that as a function of time that gives us the black curve and you see a really nice match especially over uh, but it, it's quite clear over weekly time scales but also if you zoom in you see a nice match over even diurnal time scales so the the tremor itself is not going to give us a a, or a, a volume of water but it'll give us the timing and then when we combine that with the melt modeling we'll be able to say you know, how much water is being produced, and then when is it being released. This is, uh, and these observations are building on work that seismologists had done in fluvial systems, so looking at things like bed load transport and, and shear stress from water on the, on the bottom of a river. And so in some sense, I guess this, this isn't actually that surprising of a result. Seismologists have traditionally avoided putting seismometers next to rivers because they're, they know that rivers are noisy. So we're using their noise now to, to say something about subglacial discharge. Um, and then I mentioned earlier these remotely operated surface samplers. I've put surface in. <laughs> Jonathan calls them surface samplers. Um, what's the surface to some people might be deep to others. Uh, basically, these are kind of a kayak that tows a CTD chain. Um, it also has a ADCP, so it'll be measuring water velocities and velocity shear. And 
these have a range of 150 kilometers or so. You know, we're, we're working in a fjord that's about a kilometer to a kilometer and a half wide, so we'll be able to put these in the water and just have them zip back and forth many times before they have to come back to the, the boat to be recharged. Um, they currently are communicating with a radio link, and Jonathan said that by next summer they'll also be communicating with the radio. And he's actually just sent me this photo from the Bay of Bengal where he's working at the moment. So they're getting used in a bunch of different environments. Um, and this was a, a sample of the data that he's collected in the last week. Um, at the moment, they're only sampling to a depth of 12 to 15 meters, but um, we'll be able to, to sample much deeper. They're, they're, right now, they're focused on what's happening in the, the surface waters, but they can uh, change the measurements so that we'll be sampling much deeper. So the top here is just a temperature profile versus time. Um, and then lastly, we'll be using a combination of high-rate time-lapse photography and terrestrial scanning radar to um, track changes in surface currents and also changes in uh, the flow of the, the glacier terminus area. And, and looking at how those things change as the geometry of the of that terminus area changes. So the top left is just a, um, again, I showed a similar figure previously. This is just the, the surface currents. Um, we're using the icebergs and brash ice in the fjord as, as tracers. Um, so this will help put a cap on the, the observations that Jonathan is making with his remote controlled kayaks. And then on the right, I've just projected those uh, velocity, or actually I've calculated a magnitude and then projected that onto a worldview image so we can um, look at the spatial variation in, in uh, surface currents. Um, we can also track the, the lower glacier um, using the same sort of pixel tracking methods. Um, it's a little bit more challenging to convert those into actual velocities because of the we're not projecting onto a horizontal surface. Um, and, and so to tie that into the real world, we need a, a digital elevation model. Um, and that's where the this uh, terrestrial scanning radar comes in. Um, there's a, an image of it on the lower left and then a, an example of the type of data we'll be able to get where we have the glacier flowing down into the fjord and you can see the mountain in the background. And so by running the radar and cameras at the same time, we'll be able to put the, the camera imagery into the real world and and then the cameras will, will stay there and will run throughout the project. Um, so we'll have a, a long time series of both glacier and uh, fjord behavior. Um, and then the, the radars are a bit more finicky. They'll have to be, um, basically they'll have to be babysat. So when we're doing these, those intensive field surveys, there'll be a, two or three people camped right next to the radar and just making sure it's running properly. Um, so to summarize, uh, basically what we're trying to do in this project is to quantify subglacial discharge from um, the Kant Glacier. We're going to measure the the properties of the bay, uh, both using long-term moorings and by doing hydrographic transects. Um, and those two things feed into plume dynamics. Um, we'll be sampling the plume directly with remote-controlled kayaks. Um, and then the, the plume, um, as it's entraining warm water and rising, it's going to melt the, the glacier face, um, bringing more fresh water into the plume and affecting the, the structure of that plume. And then, and then that turns back and feeds on the, the glacier dynamics. Um, in particular, we're looking at what happens in the near terminus area. So how does that submarine melting contribute to variations in, in ice flow and strain rates? Okay, uh, and that's, I think, all I have. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks very much, Jason. That was, that was a nice summary. So does anyone on the phone have a question for Jason? Uh, yeah, this is Mike Beavis. Uh, Hi. So you, you, you suggested that submarine melting is correlated with subglacial discharge. Is that purely because the subglacial discharge is warmer than the seawater, or might there be other mechanisms as well? Uh, well, it's the, the subglacial discharge is is cooler than the seawater. And um, what it, the idea is that it's it's in training that warm water, and so the more vigorously that water comes out from the glacier, the, the fresh water, um, the more potential it has to mix with the the warm, salty water in the fjord. Oh, I see. So it, it's basically driving a circulation of the seawater. The plume 
is viscously coupling with the ocean water and it's pulling the ocean water in. So it changes the circulation at the interface between the ice and the seawater. Yes, that's that's the idea. Um, I have to be a little bit careful there because there's some debate going on about the, the larger scale fjord circulation. Um, but in, in the, like right up close to the glacier within the first few kilometers, um, yes, that's what we think is happening. Certainly at Leconte, um, in, in 2012 and in previous studies, we pretty much every time we did a hydrographic transect, regardless of what the tides were doing, there was always a strong outflow at the surface and a, a strong inflow at depth um, with, mm -hmm. within, again, that's within a few kilometers of the terminus. Would that work even if there wasn't a temperature difference? Like you know, maybe some places the, the subglacial discharge is colder, but the fact that it's got less a different salinity might still cause it to drive this compaction. Right. Um, yeah. So the, the fresh because the 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 fresh water doesn't have. Yeah, it's going to be it's less dense. The the uh, the, the buoyancy there is driven. Or the um, the density is is determined mostly by salinity at those temperatures, I believe. And and so yes, even even if you didn't have a, a, a huge temperature difference, you're gonna you're gonna get that rising. Um but but that's the other part of, of, of the story is is how does the you know if you change let's say you kept the, the subglacial discharge the same but you change the fjord temperature. That that's also going to have an effect on on the submarine melt rates. And so that's why we need to have both parts of the story. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah, Alan Mix here at Oregon State. Um, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Uh, I, I tuned in a little bit late. Sorry, I was struggling to remember my password. But uh, maybe you said this at the beginning, but wh what is the temperature of the ambient seawater coming in the bottom? Um, we've measured uh, from about 4 to 7 degrees Celsius between uh, well, in 2012, we had a mooring there from June through September, and so it started off around four degrees at depth, and then by the end of the summer, it was up to about seven degrees. Oh, so really warm, uh, yeah. huge temperature gradient. Is there any any historical data that says that's changing at all? Um, it's, I mean, not. There's a little bit of data from the comps from 2000, the early 2000s. I don't think that. Data looks a whole lot different in terms of the, the you know, the temperature getting warmer. Or um, and in terms of long-term moorings in Alaska, there there is one in the in the Gulf which is showing warming. I don't remember the the rate of warming, um, but how how that's translating into what we see in fjord, I don't know. Okay, so give, given that it's pretty warm water under there, it's a relatively shallow sill depth. Is is that right? That's correct. It does have a shallow sill. Yeah, it's uh, so that that's that's one way in which it's, it's at least different than some of the some of the fjords in East Greenland, which which seem to not have much of a sill. Um, the the fjords in Greenland tend to have, or sorry, in Alaska tend to have a, a a sill, which is in some cases like at Leconte, less than 10 meters yep. below the the surface. Yep. Uh, hi, Jason. This is Patrick. Uh, hi. Hey, great. Um, just a quick question. Um, so you have a mooring within the fjord, right? Is, is there, would it be possible to, or would it make sense to also have something, especially because there is a sill, to try to monitor what's happening sort of outside of the fjord to basically connect over a longer period, sort of you know what what um, the sort of the larger scale circulation variability to uh, inner fjord variability. Yeah. Um we would love to do that, um, and actually, in the, this is this proposal that got funded was a resubmission. Um, in the earlier one, we had more, maybe two moorings. I don't remember if it was two or three, um, but we it started to feel like it was too much and maybe too broad scale. We decided we wanted to focus more on what's happening right at the terminus, um, and and not worry so much about the the larger scale fjord circulation and really focus on the on the plume itself. Okay. So this is Bill, Jason. You had talked about tracking surface currents by uh, doing comparing uh, consecutive imagery of the brash ice, and yes. the brash ice bits are not 
perfect tracers. I wondered if you'd given any thought in the team to how you might calibrate how good that is. It'll certainly give you a great qualitative picture, but if you're going after quantitative measurements, I wonder if you have any, any sense for how good a tracer those bits are of the actual currents. Right. Um, so, yeah, uh, not not exactly. I mean, what we we will get from the ADCPs, we'll have at least some. We'll have some. Uh, but we'll have we'll have measurements within a few meters of the surface, and so that'll help to to put a constraint on on. You know what the, what the surface currents actually are. So we'll be able to compare the the ADCP measurements to the to the time lapse imagery. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and and I think I think also the the smaller pieces of ice probably do a better job of, of coupling to the water than you know the, the bigger ones that there's some more inertia with associated with their movement. All right. Any other questions for Jason? If not, thank you very much, Jason. I think that was a, a nice presentation and gives people something to think about and they're. There may be opportunities for interaction with some of the other people working on similar projects or at least comparing notes back and forth. Yes, and, and, and um, you know, we are going to have a, a, you know, a couple of boats out there, and, and if there's other instruments people want to try out or if, if there's a way to take along and, and hop on their boat, um, we'd be definitely open for that idea. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Bill, this is Sarah. I'm going to interrupt here because I do think Jessica is also on the line here. Jessica, can you um, flip the ball over back to you and show the um, IARCA Collaborations website so Jason doesn't have to share his screen anymore? <laughs> I think I don't have control of it. Let's see. I think I can stop sharing. Uh, yeah, so that, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. So, over to you, Bill. Thanks. Okay, so the the other thing that was a bit more just business for the for the federal group here, so those who are non feds and, and don't want to stick around don't feel obligated to, but we have a milestone report that we have to complete sometime in the next month. I sent around a draft. We've gotten some feedback from a few people. Uh, does anyone else have comments on that draft of the milestone report? I believe that Christine from NASA, I don't know, Christine, are you on the call today? She is not. She's not, okay. Well, I think that she had said she had wanted to check a few things and possibly get back to us. But does anyone else have comments on it who's seen it? Hearing none, we'll move along. The next thing that we have is uh, Bill. Yes. Uh, so it's Alan Mix here. Yes. I, I didn't know about this at all, and I'm not a Fed, obviously. But uh, if you're filing uh, uh, reports now, since we just completed the Peterman um, expedition that had some interagency stuff, there was some NASA stuff on there as well as the NSF. Um, I, I'm not due to to give you a formal report yet, but uh, do you want an informal report if you need some of that stuff? I think that would be absolutely wonderful, Alan, if you could do that. We could okay. have the successful successful field project and uh, and some of the interagency uh, collaborations as well as as well as those that were unique to particular agencies. Thanks very okay. much. Okay, I'll send something in. Thank you. Uh, so the other thing that we have, again, for the feds only, is we have the funding spreadsheet that we need to update. Uh, I know that Sarah has received some updates from some of the agencies. I'm not sure that they're all in. I learned of a, of a new project just last week that I was unaware of beforehand that DOE is supporting. So we need to uh, update those spreadsheets with Sarah if you haven't done so recently. And the last thing on the agenda is just are there any other agency updates that anything that the agencies want to make known to the group? Uh, 
Last last year, I worked in Denmark on, on a group that worked for the Arctic Research Council, and there was a very interesting study done, and I'm not sure if you guys know about it. It was a group trying to figure out what is the future communication needs of the Arctic. You know, like, it's, and it was sort of looking out 15, 20 years, trying to project uh, how, how, how much more bandwidth you need and and how would it be implemented. And I, I guess the focus was sort of like on this space-based internet that would provide a lot of bandwidth to um, the Arctic. And part of that, part of the justification was for climate change research and Arctic research. One of the interesting the drivers of the of a, a, lo, a much larger projection of bandwidth than any other report had produced was the notion that there's going to be increasing numbers of drones operating in the Arctic, not just like aerial drones, but sea surface drones, like for example Jason's talk. Uh, you know that kayak. You could imagine eventually that kayak operating without a ship being nearby, and it could operate. You know, it could operate someplace. Uh, it might it might hide when it's bad weather, but come out when it's not. And submarine drones, so that you have drones moving around the ocean column, maybe collecting its own data, but also visiting stations that are anchored on the seafloor, collecting their data, coming up to the surface and bursting the data out in uh, to, uh, to the satellites. Also, like airplanes. Uh, commercial airplanes uh, might be uh, persuaded to collect data relevant to Arctic science. So, for example, the airplanes right now collect meteorological data, and they send that to the National Weather Service, and the rationale is it improves the weather forecasts, which is important for air safety and, you know, like economics of, of flight and so on. Where Where is the right height to be flying? So you can imagine that they've got downwards pointing radars, they've got downwards pointing lidars, they've got upwards pointing lidars, and they're just collecting this data all the time because they're just going by. And then the question would be, in some cases you'd want to analyze the data in nearly real time. For example, if you're tracking icebergs moving towards a drilling rig, then you would need to compare one airplane's image with respect to the, the next airplane's image, or one drone's image with respect to the next drone's image. So the notion was that what, is that 15, 20 years from now, there's going to be all kinds of drones in the air. Uh, some of them are, are not really going to be drones; they're going to be aircraft of opportunity, sea column drones, sea surface drones, and 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 the the, the major sort of enabler of 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 all of these drones is going to be the ability to, to send the data out and receive instructions back. And that this will require, you know, orders of magnitude more bandwidth than are presently available uh, over the Arctic. Yeah. So I, I thought this was very, very, very interesting. And I wondered if the people in the U.S. side were, were aware of this study or if there are similar studies focusing on communication infrastructure and all of the impacts that it might have. Yeah, I know that there are similar similar concerns here at the foundation. Uh, the gentleman who sits in the office next to me is particularly concerned about that, uh, predominantly for the Antarctic, but, but we have the same problems in the Arctic. Uh, it's probably not this collaboration team which should be focused on that, but certainly the uh, Arctic Observing Network uh, collaboration team should be aware of that report. If you could send a pointer to it to Sarah or myself, we could ensure that mm -hmm. it gets into the right hands. It would be very useful, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, and, I, 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 I saw the English version. I, I know there's a Danish version. I'll see if I can get uh, an official copy of the English version sent to you. Great. Thanks very much. And Bill, I would just um, let Mike know that there is also, it is a federal only working group to begin with, but there is a logistics team that is being stood up now and um, I'll make sure they also have a copy of that because it, uh, that is exactly the type of thing that they're looking into. Excellent. Yeah, I, 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 I've always felt like the communications is probably the single most important uh, kind of infrastructure that everybody can benefit of because everyone I've ever met that puts instruments in remote places has the same problem. We can't get the data out. Right. Uh, uh, can I comment on that too? Sorry to keep chiming in here on a Fed discussion, but 
Oh, uh, Alan Mix again, Oregon State. Uh, we faced that um, communications issue just last month up there, and th there's actually well-timed political interest. We happened to be on um, a telephone conversation with uh, Senator John McCain and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse at the time when our Iridium connection failed. And uh, so there was some discussion afterward that about uh, exactly the issue of communications in the Arctic. Uh, and I, <laughs> so at, at least we got their attention. Um, and then um, uh, at the same time, uh, well, just after the cruise, I had a meeting with none of it uh, representatives. And uh, it would be really uh, uh, political, uh, politically great to um, have um, uh, better uh, uh, bandwidth and communications with the uh, northern uh, Canadian communities. That that is at the very top of their agenda for how they connect with the world. Um, and uh, so, if there's something to be done there um, in collaboration with them, it would it would work wonders uh, for yeah. facilitating research. This this same report did point out there were other completely different needs, like for example, t telesurgery. Uh, education of people in Arctic communities, you know, there, there, were, there were the governmental issues, uh, public safety, uh, the emergency services, some ships in trouble, the airplanes are flying out. Everybody needs to talk to each other, and right now the communication systems are inadequate. So that so that the research was like part of it, um, but there were a lot of other uh, requirements identified, and and the notion was is that only the governments can organize a system like this. And, and that actually makes sense to pool, uh, you know, to share, to share the task because any one group can't really justify launching satellites just to set up an internet over the Arctic. But everybody collectively could, especially if, they're, if there's multiple use, military, governmental, community, and science. All right, okay, well thank you, Mike. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Michael Studinger, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Yeah. So, is there so any, is there any is there anything is there new any, from uh, from NASA that we should know about as a group? Uh, no, that would be more for Christine, who is unfortunately not uh, on. I'm pretty much like uh, unlike most other uh, kind of uh, members. I'm uh, just. Uh, more like a scientist that sends proposals to headquarters and gets them funded or not. So I'm not really sure what's happening at headquarters most of the time. Okay. So it would be more Christ, Christine to answer that question. All right, we'll, we'll keep in touch with her. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And and Shad, you're in the same situation then that, that Mike is. If you're still on the line, is there anything that USGS is doing in Alaska that's glacier oriented, that glacier fjord oriented that we should know about? Um, Bill, it looks like he left the call, ah. so um, uh, maybe we can follow up with him with an email. We will do so. All right. So unless someone else has an issue that they want to discuss with the group, I want to thank everybody. Thank Jason one more time for a, a really nice presentation, and we'll keep in touch and let you know when the next meeting will be held. Not thanks, here. Bill. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Hey, Jessica. Jessica.